So a uh, little bit of a head fake. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to continue the sort of the theme of, of developing ways in which uh, life is important for, for the climate system and for the evolution of, of, of Earth as a planet um, and got some really great uh, setup from, from Stephanie actually. Um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, primitive forms of anoxygenic photosynthesis and, and kind of um, primitive biospheres more broadly in the ways that they may have impacted the, uh, the evolution of, of Earth's early climate. And specifically, I'm going to be sort of exploring uh, how they've affected uh, the Earth's methane cycle. Um, so mo most of what I'm going to be showing was uh, was was done by a, a postdoc working with me through the NASA postdoctoral program, uh, Kazumi Ozaki, who has recently started as an assistant professor at uh, at Toho University. Um, I, I miss him greatly. He's really fantastic. Um, but uh, here's his email here. Um, he shouldn't be faulted for anything ridiculous that I say, but uh, he should receive all the credit for anything um, that you think is cool. Um, all right, so why be interested in methane? Um, so this is probably old hat to most folks here, but just to be sure, uh, one of the one of the uh, main reasons we'd be interested in methane is that it's potentially a really important uh, climate regulator for much of, of Earth's history. And so this is realized very early on um, that if you know if you estimate the the effective temperature of the Earth, so the temperature that the Earth would experience without an atmosphere radiated equilibrium with uh, with the sun. Uh, it's it would, it's below freezing even now, um, and as you as you ramp this solar constant, sorry Judith, uh, more or less a constant uh, back in time, um, you can you can get a little bit of leverage by slapping a CO two H two O greenhouse on here. Things get a little bit balmier, but even then, it doesn't take too long before you uh, dip below the the freezing point of uh, of water as a global average. Um, and we know from the rock record that this is not really something that the Earth has experienced on. Uh, on long time scales, and so this is one of the, the sort of most obvious uh, pieces of evidence, I would argue, uh, for the the idea that the the chemistry of Earth's atmosphere has evolved really dramatically over time. Um, and so one of the things that's been invoked to sort of solve this this faint young sun problem is a, a range of uh, reducing greenhouse gases. The original paper I was really interested in the possibility of ammonia, which I think is actually people are sleeping on a little bit. That's that sort of fallen out of favor, but I think is is uh, something that should be sort of revisited uh, perhaps. Um, but in particular, methane has become really interesting. Uh, to, to a lot of folks uh, over the years. And this is partially just because methane is, a, is potentially an important uh, greenhouse gas in its own right. It's also because uh, if the, the ratio between methane and CO2 in the atmosphere raises, uh, rises above uh, a certain value, you can start to, to form uh, hydrocarbon hazes, which also have radiative effects um, that in some cases are, are a little bit more complex, but um, in, in many cases tend to, to lead to, to surface cooling. And so what, one of the things that this has led to is the notion that uh, for the, the majority of, of Earth's early history, uh, the, the, the methane cycle was a really important component uh, of, of the climate system. Um, this is also interesting from a, uh, from a biosignature perspective, of course. So methane is a biogenic gas, uh, and it's, it's possible that the amount of methane in a planetary atmosphere might tell you something about uh, the presence and activity of life at the surface, either directly through methane uh, or through its, uh, its sort of downstream photochemical effects. So it turns out that there are some observables associated with haze formation um, that uh, the geoirony is really... Uh, and, and others have explored uh, uh, really elegantly. Um, and so you might be able to use this for uh, as a proxy for life uh, on, the, on the surface. I'm going to focus more on the climate uh, end of this, uh, just for the, for the sake of time. Um, and, and point out that, uh, uh, and I'll sort of circle back around to this, but um, ways of generating methane at the sort of quantities that one would probably need to affect climate, at least around a, a G-type star, like the sun, uh, are, uh, uh, are most plausibly biotic. So there are abiotic ways of generating methane, but you can kind of estimate how much sort of juice you can squeeze out of that orange, and it's not a lot uh, under, under most circumstances. Um, and so what we're really sort of interested in is looking at um, what, the, what the biosphere can do. And actually, there hasn't been a ton of bandwidth spent on this. There's been decades of really amazing work uh, you know, forcing 1D photochemical models with a boundary flux and seeing what atmospheric chemistry you get. But there's been, I would argue, less bandwidth spent on what are the actual plausible fluxes that a biosphere might generate under different configurations of, of a biosphere. So this is what I'm going to kind of focus on today. There's actually a couple of great posters on this um, uh, out there as, as well that you should check out. Um, so Stephanie has done some really great work looking at how this works on a world with oxygenic photosynthesis, um, which is a, it, an exceptionally complex problem. Um, I'm, I'm a little too simple-minded for that, so I'm going to ignore it. Um, uh, so there's, there's a number of different ways of sort of powering a biosphere photosynthetically. One way is to uh, get your, your electrons from water uh, and, uh, and you know, split water with energy from the sun, make biomass, and, and in the process give off oxygen. This creates a, a world uh, in, in which the methane cycle, the sort of landscape of the methane cycle is really complicated for reasons that, that Stephanie outlined really well. Um, you, you have to not just 
uh, account for aerobic oxidation of methane, but you have to also account for the anaerobic oxidation of methane, which is a huge sink um, and is going to depend on, uh, uh, in some cases, relatively poorly defined links between the oxygen and the sulfur cycles um, and that sort of thing. But there's a couple of other ways to, to skin this cat, and actually uh, most of them are, are more primitive than oxygenic photosynthesis. Oxygenic photosynthesis is biochemically uh, a really uh, uh, sort of uh, ridiculous feat in some ways. Linking these two photosystems together um, is, a, uh, is, is, of course, really impressive. It allows you to strip electrons off of water. Um, but there are much simpler forms of photosynthesis that evolved uh, much earlier. Um, and we could sort of haggle about this, but uh, are, are perhaps uh, more widespread on habitable planets um, throughout, uh, throughout the universe. Um, so one way uh, you can go about doing this, it's the same process. You're taking inorganic carbon, you have an electron donor, you take energy from the sun, you fix carbon, you make some sort of reduced, uh, or, sorry, oxidized product as a byproduct. So you can use hydrogen, uh, you can use uh, iron as well. So you can take reduced iron uh, and make essentially rust. So this is a, a, um, an anoxygenic uh, photosynthesizer oxidizing iron and sort of coating its cell uh, with, with iron oxide particles. So this is a process that's, that's referred to as photoferrotrophy. Um, you can also, as, as Stephanie showed in Fayetteville Green Lake, you can use uh, reduced sulfur as a substrate as an electron donor as well. Um, I'm going to focus on these two uh, particular metabolisms um, uh, for, for this talk. Um, and so uh, what we're, what we're going to try and do is, is sort of build a simple model of a, a kind of primitive biosphere. So a biosphere that, that has these primitive anoxygenic forms of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis powered by hydrogen, photosynthesis powered by iron. Um, and then the sort of uh, the, a sort of basic downstream organic matter processing uh, set of metabolisms um, that are that are also uh, believed to be quite ancient. So uh, a fermentation of this photosynthetically produced organic matter uh, to things like acetate, which can subsequently be consumed by dissimilatory iron reduction um, or converted to methane. Uh, and then this methane interacts with uh, an atmospheric uh, photochemical model. Um, and we also have a, a volcanic reductant flux and, and hydrogen escape to space. This is kind of the, the sort of topology of, of the model that we're using. Um, so, so we have a couple different versions of this. We, we have a, a model that, that uh, uses a, a full 1D photochemical model and that is explicitly coupled with the ocean. Um, I'm actually not going to show any results in that. Um, we've basically the, we've used that to validate a simpler analytical model um, of, of the biosphere. Uh, and uh, and uh, so that allows us to, to do a, a probabilistic approach, allows us to do you know, millions of calculations of what the fluxes and atmospheric compositions ought to be um, uh, based on uh, this, this simpler analytical model. So those are the, um, those are the results I'll, I'll show. Um, and if you're curious about that, um, come, and, come and talk to me later. Um, so this will be old hat for most folks as well, but just to be sure this is kind of uh, what we're doing. So we assume you know, most of the parameters in these models are really poorly constrained. And so uh, we assume some uh, statistical distribution uh, for these parameters and sample randomly amongst them. Um, this is actually a little bit misleading because we basically have no sense whatsoever of what the underlying distributions of these parameters would be. Uh, we're almost always doing uniform or log uniform distributions. This is you know, rather than something like this. Um, so we sample randomly. We come up with some sampling criterion. I'm going to show results for models in which we have a global average surface temperature uh, above 288K. And this is, this is computed from an offline radiative convective uh, climate model. Um, Probably not the best way to do this. I'd actually like to hassle folks who spend a lot of time doing uh, GCMs uh, to sort of help us in, improve this. Um, so, uh, so we're sampling models that, um, that give us this temperature and, and also that uh, give us methane CO2 ratios that are below uh, 0.2, which is about the point where um, some of these uh, cooling effects induced by the formation of uh, hydrocarbon hazes uh, take effect. So um, I'm not trying to necessarily advocate for this particular world. You could, you could equally well, if you're interested in looking for the presence of haze, for example, you could equally well invert this and sample those results instead. Um, this is just kind of an example of, of the approach we're, we're taking. Um, and I think there's there's a sort of a lot of work to do, um, sort of changing these uh, these sampling metrics, um, and then analyzing them uh, statistically for uh, sort of which combinations of different parameters allow for a particular climate state or uh, a particular uh, methane photochemistry in the atmosphere. That's kind of the idea. All right, so um, I'm going to have to sort of rush through this pretty quickly. So we're varying atmospheric CO2, the preservation or efficiency of organic carbon and the global redox balance, the outgassing flux of uh, reduced gases i.e. H2. Uh, this is iron, iron to upwelling flux isn't actually really the way to think about this. One should think of this as sort of the, the, the flux of reduced iron from the solid earth, really. Um, and they're not exactly the same thing because you can recycle iron in the ocean interior. Um, and, uh, and then we vary the, the, the fraction of iron that's produced from uh, oxygen, anoxygenic photosynthesis that becomes re-reduced through dissimilatory iron reduction. And again, this is something we impose as a, as a parameter. 
Um, and so we vary all these over ranges that are sort of plausible for the early Earth, uh, with the exception of the, the iron flux, the, some of these up, the upper end of this iron, these iron fluxes, I would argue, are pretty obscene. Uh, thanks. Uh, but but uh, we're doing it anyway. Because um, why not? Um, you can do whatever you want to. Um, all right, so here are some results. Um, there's, there's tons of uh, ways to sort of look at this, but I'm just going to show one just to kind of give you a sense of how we're thinking about this. So on the left is, is a biosphere in which the, the, uh, the, the only form of photosynthesis in the model is, is anoxygenic uh, iron-based photosynthesis. And so what, the, what these results are showing are uh, mo the, sort of the probability distribution of models that give us this uh, uh, global average surface temperatures above 288 and methane CO2 ratios below 0.2. Um, as a function of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, if you're an astronomer, you might like bar. If you're a, a doofus like me, you might like uh, relative to the present atmospheric level. Um, and then uh, against the, 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 uh, the, the flux of, um, of iron two into the system on the y-axis. Um, so you can see for the purely iron-based system, you, you're sort of stuck up in this little corner up here where you need relatively high uh, CO2 and really just screaming iron fluxes in order to prevent either haze formation or uh, relatively low temperatures um, in order to get into this sort of warm, haze-free world that we're, that we're trying to sample. Um, if you add both of the, these primitive photosynthetic metabolisms together, you expand this, uh, this sort of warm, haze-free solution space uh, really quite a bit, and you, you extend it down uh, to, to iron fluxes that are now starting to be quite reasonable for the Earth, uh, and particularly the Archean Earth. So just to kind of orient you a little bit here, if you were to put the modern Earth on here, well, the modern Earth is sort of plotting off the scale, obviously, uh, uh, really with respect to both of these. Um, but if you imagine the Archean Earth uh, somewhere around here, um, this is the difference between being uh, uh, a sort of warm, uh, haze-free world and, and not uh, by, by quite a bit. Um, in this case, I think this is, this is about, I'd be interested to sort of wrangle with people about this at some point. This is about as much iron as I think you can pump into the system in the Archean, although that's not a terribly well-constrained thing. All right, so what I'd just sort of like to leave you with is, uh, is something that's a little bit more schematic because once um, you introduce the iron cycle into things, uh, things become sort of non-intuitive and, and pretty complicated uh, quickly. So uh, we're starting to try and get quantitative about this, but one of the things that we think this, this sort of implies is that the iron cycle is really important for the climate of planets uh, that have reducing atmospheres. Um, uh, and this is because it links into the, uh, it links into the methane cycle and thus the, the carbonate uh, silicate system um, so you can imagine, for example, uh, increasing uh, hydrothermal iron flux, which is going to change the methane flux, the amount of methane in the atmosphere, temperature. This is going to feed back on silicate weathering, which is going to draw down CO2, change ocean pH. And the, the changes in ocean pH are going to have uh, nonlinear and, in some cases, counterintuitive effects on the solubility of iron minerals in the ocean, and thus the amount of substrate available for uh, anoxygenic photosynthesis. And we've listed siderite here as one example of this, but this is true for carbonated green rust. This will be true for grenolite. All of these phases, their, their, sol their solubilities in the ocean are going to depend on, uh, on the, the pH of seawater. Um, and this is sort of for a haze-free case. If you imagine a world that has haze, um, now you start to interact with uh, the sort of complex uh, radiative effects of, uh, of hazes. And so we're trying to develop a, an open system carbon cycle model that, that does the iron cycle reasonably well to sort of uh, probe some of the feedbacks that might be in play here. Um, but that's sort of sort of work in progress. But if nothing else, I hopefully uh, have convinced you that um, uh, that the iron cycle is a potentially a really important part of the climate system. Uh, and this is particularly true for planets that have relatively primitive biospheres, planets that, that have uh, pervasively reducing uh, ocean atmosphere conditions. Um, so, so again, the coupling uh, of different forms of anoxygenic photosynthesis could have been a really important component of Earth's early climate, especially in the, in the, in the Hadean and, and uh, early Archean. Um, and, uh, and I would argue, uh, uh, to sort of spitball a little bit, that, that the iron cycle is actually a really important component of the climate system on reducing worlds. And so these are common planets um, uh, in which we're looking for things like methane-based or methane-CO2 combined biosignatures. We really need to be considering uh, how the iron cycle behaves and what observables we can look for to sort of infer what the iron cycle might be doing uh, on, uh, on these sorts of planets. Uh, and the last point is, is actually totally irrelevant, so you can just ignore that. Um, all right, thanks. Hey, questions? Okay. <laughs> cool talk. Uh, on, yes. Uh, so one of the cool things about ferrous iron in the surface oceans is it does interact with UV radiation and yeah. it does emit hydrogen. How does that play into Oof. your story about the, the hybrid system of both hydrogen eaters and ferrous iron eaters? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So, right. So, um, one of the weaknesses in the model is that we it doesn't really ha it's not spatially explicit. 
And so what we've kind of done um, is implicitly assume that anoxygenic photosynthesis is sort of perfectly efficient at consuming upwelling iron. Um, I don't know, in many cases that's probably okay, I, I think. Um, but it's a, it's a really interesting point. Um, and so this is one of the reasons that I can only show these kind of, uh, these silly cartoons, because you know this, this whole bit right here is exceptionally complex. And one of the things that we're, uh, we've, we've sort of broken this out into a multi-box model now and are, are, are in the process of trying to incorporate is uh, photochemical iron oxidation. I mean, and doing there's lots of different ways one would do that, and it, it sort of makes the model much more cumbersome. And uh, um, but uh, but yeah, it's, uh, the the simple answer is I don't I don't know. Um, I mean, I think my my guess is that there's going to be a pretty tight stoichiometric relationship between that hydrogen flux that's generated by photo oxidation relative to the kind of net hydrogen flux that's generated by anoxygenic photosynthesis followed by fermentation, followed by methane degassing, followed by methane photochemistry, if that, if that makes sense. Um, I wouldn't take a bullet for that, but that's my intuition. Good question, though.